Good afternoon. I'm David Lamb, and I have to confess to being a lifelong investment banker in the uh, media space and information industry. Um, started with a company called Verona Suler and Associates in the 1980s. Did uh, work in the business information space uh, then with Reed, Elsevier, and VNU. Uh, helped handle the, the sale of the notable um, peer-reviewed journal, The National Enquirer, in the late 80s. Um, uh, uh, so I've had a pretty diverse, uh, diverse background. For the past couple decades, my practice has been mainly in consumer book publishing. Uh, so it's refreshing to be here today. And uh, my firm, STM Advisors, is currently active in a couple of buy-side representations of notable, um, prominent, actually, um, uh, uh, actors, uh, associations in the STM sphere. So I want to um, uh, give a brief overview of the uh, M&A market as it, it, I perceive it um, uh, uh, in STM and scholarly. Uh, I want to compare and contrast to some degree uh, how it operates in the consumer book uh, industry uh, with many, ben uh, many uh, attributes in, in the favor of this room as opposed to Book Expo where I was yesterday. Uh, and I want to talk a little bit about activity and trends. Uh, uh, who's buying whom and for what reasons in the STM sphere. And uh, if time allows, I'd like to get a little bit into the nuts and bolts of both the buy side and sell side mergers and acquisitions process um, and talk a little bit about how, about the similarities that licensing of journals has to outright M&A. So coming, uh, uh, I, I guess I should make one more confession, which is that I, uh, my bias uh, in terms of publishers seeking growth is to uh, think of mergers and acquisitions as an unqualified good and a clear, inorganic um, uh, complement to the types of organic growth that uh, uh, Michael and Joe have spoken about. Um, you know, it's uh, clearly an accretive activity. Um, and why is it special? What is special about uh, the, uh, the STM and scholarly market in, in terms of uh, uh, its characteristics and why it's a fertile, why is it a fertile um, field? Well, unlike consumer book publishing, which is uh, uh, gerrymandered by territory and language, uh, your activity is a worldwide uh, discourse conducted in English by uh, uh, a global cohort of researchers. It's also, um, it's important in a way that uh, Kim Kardashian's book of selfies is not terribly important. Uh, and that, uh, uh, that con contribution to, to knowledge um, does a couple of things uh, and a couple of things that, that are critical to, um, to the values uh, uh, in this industry. Um, it creates uh, financially attractive qualities. Uh, I remember a supervisory board member of Elsevier uh, tutoring me, schooling me really, about how some of his journals could have cash flow margins in excess of 100% in, in the uh, 1980s, which to me, sounded like the square root of negative one. Um, uh, but he uh, allowed us how the cash came in up front. They earned money on it. It cost very little uh, for them to serve out those subscriptions. And uh, hence, you had an extraordinarily good business. Of course, that's underpinned by the fact that journal, contact, uh, journal content and STM content is need to know content for, um, uh, for the industry. The, unlike Consumer publishers also, the, uh, uh, I don't want to minimize the distinctions between associations and commercial publishers, between large and small, but the uh, book and journal um, granular products are, um, are very comparable across disciplines and across companies in a way that a coffee table book um, from Abrams is not directly comparable to a romance from Harlequin. So you've got a, um, 
a situation where acquirers and sellers can speak a very common language, although they may be speaking about uh, editorially very different uh, topics. There is a, a wide range of, the full range of players, in term, from the very largest to single journal, small book list publishers. Um, and that is reflected in uh, very small sub million dollar uh, uh, fill-in acquisitions to, of course, the, um, uh, the uh, uh, mammoth uh, combination that created Springer Nature uh, a month ago. Um, you also have, you know, digital is better understood these days um, and is a part of the environment. Uh, it, it's similar in the e-book um, uh, penetration in consumer book publishing. But because there's more of a research workflow, there are more ways uh, that I can see that digital um, new products can influence and add value to existing content or to existing workflows and companies. So there is, uh, there's activity, there, there's a percolation up uh, of innovation and that is creating some opportunity for companies to uh, capitalize on that by purchasing um, uh, or uh, allying themselves with, with those startups. Finally, I think, uh, and in red, I think this is the only line in red uh, in the presentation, it's just absolutely striking. Um, the uh, proportion of, of economic value in this industry created by, by not-for-profit participants, um, a third roughly. Um, uh, as I understand it. So, uh, and that, um, I think we'll, we'll talk more about that, but, but it's just, a, it's a feature you don't see in consumer book publishing. I don't think you see it in the cement industry. Um, uh, and uh, it really conditions w some of the transaction shapes that take place in terms of licensing. And it's probably generally a retardant to the pace of acquisitions uh, overall, though I, uh, I, I think there are some indications that that will, will change. And so uh, there's plenty of scope for acquisitions. Not everything has to be spring or nature. Not everything has to be you know, um, uh, operative at the, the $3 billion um, enterprise value, 3 billion euro, excuse me, enterprise value uh, level. Um, this uh, chart shows a distribution um, of journal output by number of publishers. So the left bar shows that there are you know, more than 2,000 single journal publishers. Um, how are they going to get growth? How, um, you know, by combining with others? And on the other end of the scale, at the demand arrow, you've got the large combines. Um, and for them to get growth, they have to acquire you know, single journal publishers, 50 journal publishers, Nature Publishing Group, and so forth. Um, so there's a complete kind of food chain, and transactions take place at each step in this, uh, uh, in this linkage. Um, I think going forward, we would expect to see uh, more transactions in the middle. Um, you know, a, a, a five journal uh, acquisition just doesn't move the needle for a one and a half billion euro organization. Um, and as, uh, you know, as, as Michael and Joe have, have pointed out, as the growth curve flattens, there's more of an imperative in the middle market to combine and, and grow inorganically. Um, just quickly, you know, as I've noted, there are um, both a, a high quotient of not-for-profit participants. You've got the full range of commercial publishers from multi-billion to um, multi-hundred thousand dollar. Uh, you have uh, university presses. You have, obviously, learned uh, and scientific societies. And the complexity here is that um, each type of company or institution is answerable in a unique way to its constituency, to its, um, to its members or to its owners, and that creates um, transaction friction to some degree. Uh, it creates a, a set of biases and imperatives that 
are extra commercial uh, in some cases. Um, and that has to be taken into account. It also creates um, sometimes pretty impressive bureaucracies. Uh, and uh, projects have to be guided uh, very gingerly through, uh, through an approval process. Um, uh, and, and then surrounding kind of the core content creation business, you have uh, platform providers such as Silverchair um, and services providers and, and startups as well. So you've got a, a highly um, uh, intricate ecosystem uh, and transactions can cross a, a, a bunch of different um, uh, boundaries here. So if we step back and, and if you take my point that um, mergers are, are generally a good thing, um, something devoutly to be wished, um, this is a very healthy environment in which to, um, to conduct them. Not just in, in STM, not just in scholarly, not just in consumer book publishing, but um, across uh, all industries. Um, we've got a very healthy mid-recovery economy. We have, looks to be relatively clear sailing going forward. There is an unconscionable amount of private capital available, about $1.3 trillion. Uh, dollars, um, you know, as we say, if we get even one percent of that, we'll uh, we'll be in good stead. Um, uh, but that spans venture, private equity, uh, and so forth. We've got very low interest rates, and we uh, are seeing uh, lenders and hedge funds begin to exhibit some irrational exuberance. Um, and so we've got a, just a tremendous uh, financial background. Uh, to uh, uh, to the transaction environment, and then on the the association corporate strategic side, we've had uh, a, a 2008 2009 depths of the crisis where um, there was a real pause in activity, and it has taken, as these things do, I think, a lot of time to come out of that trough, and so there are a f you know two or three or four lost years where there was relatively light transaction activity. And I think there's, you know, we're seeing uh, corporations um, want to make up for that lo lost time. I mean, typically in my consumer um, uh, book activity, I'll have a pretty equal balance of sell side assignments and buy side assignments. I have all the interest uh, uh, I can manage on, on the buy side from very large publishers to to mid-sized publishers wanting, finally, really needing, feeling that they, they must, um, uh, must uh, bulk up. Uh, and, and of course, uh, uh, noted at the outset, it's a global industry. Um, uh, you know, the number of China researchers in China is, is approaching that in the US, and we have more output, article volume increases, uh, and uh, there is, d despite the uh, growth curve challenges worldwide, there is um, you know a healthy a healthy supply side in terms of content. So just to pass over quickly, um, a, a few uh, a, a list kind of meant to give some complexion of the variety of transactions that are out there. There is the big deal um, getting much bigger with uh, Springer, the combination to create Springer Nature, um, which um, you know Springer's the first word, uh, the the first term, but in fact, uh, uh, Holtzbrink is the majority owner of the combine. You had in in the monograph uh, sector, you had Peter Lang, the venerable Swiss, UK, US publisher, um, being um, uh, sold through a deliberate process that eventuated in uh, management buyout by Swiss management. And that may say something about um, that company specifically, that it didn't find a peer buyer. Um, it may say something about the softness in book pu publishing relative to journal publishing. Um, you know, I think a real watershed uh, in, you know, two years ago last month, um, Elsevier's acquisition of, of Mendeley um, signaling the, uh, the need to 
preemptively acquire a, uh, a disruptive startup um, driven by technology um, uh, just shows how, and, and kind of along with that, Wiley's acquisition of, of uh, Symbiosis, um, uh, a, a drug modeling software company, how technology is seeping into the acquisition pipelines of, of uh, content and publishing based uh, companies. Um, and then uh, more traditionally, you've got Sage buying last, last year, I think, um, nine symposium journals in education and allied fields. And that, that is the um, bread and butter type of transaction that's been going on for, for 40 years. Uh, finally, just uh, I, I want to keep drawing a little insistently the uh, thought that a license arrangement is a form of limited merger. Um, lots, of uh, lots of money at stake, uh, key franchise uh, assets being hypothecated to, to the license, uh, licensee. Um, and so one example of this, um, I think Joe worked on last year, was Oslo's uh, license to Wiley, the American Society of Limnologists and Oceanographers. Thank you. Um, so what, uh, in these transactions, what influences valuation? Uh, scale, uh, generally uh, larger scale, higher relative value, um, higher multiples, as, as we'd say. Um, stability of performance will uh, bring in uh, more financial uh, sponsor interest, private equity interest, because uh, lenders will be comfortable lending against that consistency. You know, uh, financial performance, whether excellent or underperforming, kind of cuts both ways. If you have a company performing uh, at absolutely, you know, 100 percent of potential, the only place an acquirer may see that um, company going is a little bit further down and may uh, uh, mark it down relatively. Conversely, you have a maybe a, a print-based publisher that's underperforming, under-transitioned into digital, where in combination a new acquirer can can bring it up to snuff. That might get a uh, a higher valuation uh, relative to its uh, current performance. Um, but you know the core of these, uh, the, the core value of. STM and scholarly and academic um, uh, publishers is their intellectual property, typically in content terms, occasionally in technology terms. Um, and the primacy of that um, and uh, the primacy of their content uh, in terms of impact and uh, prestige and uh, broadness of their user base is the core variable in terms of how attractive these um, these businesses are. Um, I'm asking here, what's at risk because, uh, uh, you know, M&A conjures visions of millions of dollars changing hands, kind of high-flying um, uh, 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 transactions, and that's often true, um, but I think we have to put it in context. We have, you know, uh, in SSP, in STM, highly large, highly profitable association-driven businesses. Um, uh, to say nothing of the large commercial enterprises, where, you know, the endowments of some are approaching, you know, decent hedge fund size. Uh, so to um, you know, and they have multi-hundred million dollar businesses. So to, to make, um, uh, uh, you know, five to ten million dollar investments is not absurd, even though it may kind of go against the grain of the, the inherent conservatism of, of uh, an association or institution like that. There's also a, a, a risk in doing nothing, right? There's, you know, we've talked about the growth curve flattening, um, uh, you know, to support the mission of a society, 
um, uh, a primary asset like its publisher has to continue to grow. So there's a risk of just standing still as well. That's another impetus. And of course, if you're buying a, a nascent technology business, you run the risk of, of paying a venture type multiple and overpaying, but um, that's not a risk I see many um, participants uh, here willing, uh, willing to confront. I'm gonna skip the process uh, both on the sell side and the buy side, just to say uh, it's complicated, it's rigorous, it is highly orchestrated. Um, there's a great deal of preparation of financial data, positioning, sales data that uh, has to take place either on the sell side uh, where the process is kind of clearer or on the buy side where you have to, where uh, a purchaser has to actively canvas often for opportunities and then process them in a very deliberate way. Um, so I'll, I'll let these two, two slides speak for themselves and just finish off, I'm just uh, sorry to harp on this, but um, from my M&A headset, I just can't fail but, but see that, um, and with the high quotient of, of society and association uh, uh, franchises, um, I can't fail but see that this looks a lot like M&A. It looks like a freehold, you know, for 99 years instead of, well, or for five years, um, instead of an outright purchase of a house. Um, but these are high, significant transa high significance transactions. Um, I looked at um, an active intermediaries website and you average the incremental benefit they uh, uh, say that they've brought to four situations. That incremental benefit averaged at $7.5 million. I'm sure that's some of their better results, but still that's, those are significant transactions <coughs> worthy of the same level of preparation and care um, a, as an outright purchase. Um, and they, they typically have features in common uh, with, uh, with control transactions, cash purchase, earnings over time, uh, and a royalty uh, figure. So uh, I just uh, want to, uh, as we think about M&A as an as a activity, uh, an avenue to growth in this area, I think we also have to evaluate licensing transactions as uh, a p potential component of that, um, that growth. Thanks. So Mike, why don't, you, why don't you come up? We're gonna do a q and I'm gonna, I have a couple of questions just to get it started, but then those of you that have questions, we'll, we'll take them from the floor. So the, the first thing I'd like to address to each of you is uh, uh, to, to request, first of all, uh, a definition of scale and then a brief discussion about why scale matters and is important in, in growth and in this marketplace. I, I, I hear the word scale misused a great deal and misunderstood. So perhaps you guys could talk about why scale uh, matters and does it matter more now in the in the networked information age than it than it did in the physical age. Um, I, well, so one way in which scale matters in in, in this industry, of course, is the institutional sale. Um, so if there is only so much money in the library budget, and your organization um, is has a package that is um, large and has much must-have contents in it, um, it goes to the top of the list, or it could go to the top of the list, um, and you the library buys a few of those and, and then looks at what's left over, and what's left over goes to everyone else. Um, so that's one way in which scale um, is a significant factor um, in terms of the library market. Um, I'll let Joe and David answer that for other contexts. You know, in, in terms of the transaction um, context, the old saw that it's just as easy to do, you know, a $100 million deal as it is to do a million dollar deal um, is true. And, and in fact, there's, 
because there's more riding on a large transaction, um, uh, you know, from a process standpoint, the, the moves are pretty much the same, but there's more attention and um, uh, it's often easier to do a large deal than to sell a six or seven hundred thousand dollar publisher. Um, there's more interest, more traction. Um, that doesn't really um, uh, issue uh, Thane, but from my workaday uh, activity, that's that's what I like. So, uh, when you're dealing with uh, end user data, uh, scale matters because you're dealing with statistics. Uh, but the bigger the data set, the less likely you are to uh, introduce statistical errors. So that, that is the reason that you want to have scale in, in, in doing that. And, and just one last point on the, on the library side, um, it, or institutional sales side more generally. It, it's also, it spreads costs. So if you're, just think of sales, for example, if you're going to go sell your journals to John Hopkins University or whatever the next university over is, if you're selling five journals or 500 journals or 5,000 journals, it takes the same number of people to go over to meet with the librarian. Um, so there's an economy of scale in terms of um, many things, of which institutional sales is probably the most important. But there, it also, of course, you can get better deals in terms of um, production um, deals with with vendors and 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 um, can invest in other kinds of efficiencies. Well, right. I mean, I, I was also getting at operating scale, which is to say a single journal that has $3 million in revenue versus Springer Nature that has $3 billion. Yeah. Uh, it doesn't cost Springer Nature a thousand times as much to provide, you know, their technology platform, their sales force, their uh, GNA, anything like that, right? So, so that puts the small organization at a fundamental operating disadvantage in terms of spinning off dollars for R&D. And I guess my, my point was that uh, R&D and investment in one or several streams of new product development, as you've talked about, takes, takes dollars from somewhere. And so the more scale you have on an operating basis, the more dollars you have to pursue those opportunities. Would you, you agree with that? Yeah, no, I, I, I do. I, I don't think that means others can't pursue those opportunities. And there are other advantages in being small, which is being more nimble, but, but certainly that that is true that um, larger means typically more money to throw at more things. Another, another question I have is we've talked a lot in this meeting over the years about the shifting skill set that's required in the publishing enterprise and, and maybe specifically in the scholarly and professional publishing enterprise. Um, this is yet another new set of skills for us to think about that are probably particularly alien to the not-for-profit uh, component uh, of our audience. Um, but, we, you know, we've talked about how the acquisitions editor over the years had to grow into being a product manager or a product owner. What are the skills that are required to strategically evaluate and then operationally execute on, on, on these growth opportunities? And I, I think particularly in M&A, <laughs> but, but I mean, I think all, any of the above. Well. This, this may be an obvious comment to make, but I think the, the main issue is the ability to think strategically about an entire ecosystem instead of thinking about an organization as a standalone entity. Uh, that all of these organizations exist in relationships with other organizations. Uh, the situation is dynamic. The word sustainable is a very unfortunate word because no ecosystem is sustainable. They all degrade over time. And what you need is a management group, which includes a board of directors that is able to understand the, sh the shifting dynamics of that ecosystem so that the organization can be steered in the right direction. Um, I'll, I'll just make one comment here. We, we, the, in kind of looking back, one of the, or the last decade and a half um, and the activities that um, I, I talked about earlier, in terms of site licenses and um, the, you know, putting together big deals and so forth. Publishers have invested in um, lots of new skill sets, um, institutional sales forces, um, is, and, and marketing groups that can um, market to institutions and end users and so forth. Um, are new areas of expertise for a lot of publishers. 
Um, but their their expertise in terms of selling existing product lines. Um, and so we, there's still this sort of, you know, we've operationalized journals and we've operationalized books and we've got people that do that and we have people that do this. Um, and a lot of public, some, some of the larger publishers have started to develop um, sales or uh, product development groups that are starting to, as Joe said, look at the ecosystem and then figure out, okay, how do we creatively um, use our assets or perhaps acquire new assets or develop new assets uh, that can um, go after some of these opportunities that we identify. And that's a very new skill set in and of itself. And then w what those folks come up with might be something that's not a book or a journal. Hopefully it is, neither of those things. And therefore, you then have to have a whole new skill set of people that operationalize that. So we're talking about a lot of um, investment in people with very different skills um, and experiences than um, some publishers may currently have in-house. We'll open it up to questions from the floor. Robert? Very, a very interesting question. You know, is, is there a, a inherent conflict between what's good for a, uh, a target, if you will, users, and and what's good for the transactor or the acquiring company? And um, look, certainly, uh, and you know, forgive me for speaking glibly, and from the viewpoint of someone who loves having deal flow and doing deals. Um, uh, but certainly, uh, as M and A as mergers play out in um, you know in companies, uh, no, it, it's uh, actually hardly ever a, a black and white uh, a benefit. And there are um, uh, there are certainly instances where uh, uh, you know uh, the acquiring company is subsumed and kind of disappears into. Uh, the maw of a larger company, and that uh, is felt as a loss uh, by by the target's users. Um, but um, so so you're absolutely right. You know, it's it's not um, from a societal standpoint. It's not you know always uh, a, a positive outcome. Um, but I do think it's you know in a context where there are so many. Uh, mission-driven, not-for-profit uh, organizations, it, it's certainly not top of the list as a mode of action. And I, I guess part of what I'm advocating for is that there are, there's a real value to uh, thinking of, of uh, properties and companies as uh, things that can be combined uh, acquired or divested, and I, I wanted to bring some of that um, that that thinking to uh, to the discussion. Uh, uh, a story comes to mind. So, how, how many are familiar with the Public Theater in New York City? Any show of hands? You, it, so, it's a it's it's a great gigantic facility down on Lafayette Street. You know, multi blocks long. Uh, they produce experimental new plays. They have Joe's Pub. They get their their real estate facility is a nine figure place. Uh, and they produce interesting new work, some of which goes on to be very commercially viable. So they do, Hamilton, which is the hottest show 
now on Broadway started there and bloody, bloody Andrew Jackson and so forth. But anyway, not-for-profit organization, very much about mission, very focused on their mission. Does anybody here know how the public theater is funded? Well, it's nice of you, those of you who send them 100 bucks a year, but that doesn't help much in comparison to the real source of the money. The real source of money is in 1972, they produced a show called Chorus Line. And they own the rights to Chorus Line, and, every, uh, and, and they have a massive licensing deal. But they also recognize that we're not in the business in our, in our organization of, putting a, of optimally optimizing Chorus Line for Broadway and global touring and blah, blah. That's not what we do. But we've created this very valuable intellectual property, and so they sought out a way to continue to monetize that to support their mission, while at the same time recognizing they weren't a Broadway producer, they weren't a producer of global tours, et cetera, et cetera, or somebody who could do licensing and merchandising at a global commercial scale. So they have you know, collected massive amounts of funding and continue to this day to do so from the royalties of Chorus Line to support the original mission. I guess the, the, the point being that you have to look at your assets and your capabilities and your organization, organization scale and figure out how can I optimally put all of that together. And to, 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 to David's last point about how licensing can be a proxy uh, for, for M&A, uh, it, it's very worthy of considering uh, how it can actually support your mission, not just undermine your mission or sell out, so to speak. But Well, I, I, just to, to respond quickly, I mean, I um, acknowledge your point, but I think we also have to acknowledge that um, there's arbitrage taking place every day with society assets. Commercial publishers are making money on the licenses, right? You know, that's margin that is appropriated uh, that certainly funds the the society the licensing society but that's a financial transaction and the licensees would not be doing that if um, uh, uh, if, it, if it wasn't in their best interest so th that's a just on the point of arbitrage itself um, I don't know if Michael uh, or Joe you want to talk about mission uh, what I want to say is that we live in the world that the library is created uh, it's library consortia that demand big deals. It's library consortia that will not even get take appointments from individual society publishers with one or two journals. Uh, I just uh, gave a presentation to ICOLC in Albany about two or three weeks ago. ICOLC, if you don't know the name, is the International Coalition of Library cons uh, Consortia. And I, I really don't believe that these li uh, library consortia understand that they have uh, they have uh, structural activities that have influenced the growth of the big deal and are creating the very situation that they deplore, but they seem to be uninterested in changing their practices. I'll, I mean, I'll only add to that, I, you know, it was um, I, w one of the things that I know I want to emphasize and that I saw emphasizing David's talk w was talking about mergers and acquisitions within the context as well as the of another tool in the tool chest um, that anybody any organization can bring to bear um, in terms of um, look, looking at opportunities so 
while at, certainly at one end of the spectrum there are these giant deals, um, what, there are also opportunities for not-for-profit organizations, small organizations, to say, okay, here's an opportunity. We could build a new product. We could, or perhaps there's something that we can buy to get to market faster. Um, and that's something that um, I think societies have not um, thought of uh, or don't, don't think of as, as, as much as, as they could, precise and professional associations, as an option. Um, so, you know, I think that there are um, a lot of facets to M&A that's not simply the, um, you know, the, the, the big, big deals that are uh, leveraged by um, private equity. Other questions or comments? They're welcome. Thank you. Others? All right. Well, thank you. I think we are the only thing that stands between you and the beer tasting or something. So let's thank our panelists one more time. Thank you for attending.